All right, excellent. Okay. So this session is the looking towards the future speculative one, which of course is fraught with danger. Luckily, I've got two people here whose biographies required six-point type. Um, I'm not going to spend the next 20 minutes reading them out, but uh, over here on stage right is Andrew McAfee from MIT. He's the co-director of the MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy and many other things. If anybody wants this and know more about him, or you could use the internet, I guess. And then uh, Larry Smarr, who is the former head of the San Diego Supercomputing Center and by training originally a physicist, and it's funny in computing there are many, many physicists because in fact physics turns out to be about data a lot of the time. So we're here to talk about what the next five years are. So I was thinking about this session before we came on and I realized that this year I've been using something close to the internet for 30 years. So in 85, I got on a network in the UK where there's a few universities were involved, there were a few universities in the US. And looking over the 30 year span, it feels like enormous things have changed. I had anonymous FTP, it was very, very slow. But looking at the last five years, it almost feels static. It almost feels as if oh, things haven't changed very much. Now, uh, is this the ranting of an old man who can't see the changes, or you know, what's, hap what's happening with the, the change in the internet? Um, with all respect, I think it's largely the ranting of an old geek. All right. Um, <laughs> who, who doesn't really see some of the really profound changes. So you've been on the net for 30 years. I've been there for about 20. Right. And as I was preparing for this panel, I thought about what mission statement we would have written for the internet if we were being high-minded about it when we sat down and started playing with this thing. And my mission statement was something like, the internet should connect the world's people and give them tools uh, for education and for self-expression. That was kind of my mission statement for the internet. And I thought, how have we been doing on that mission statement? And my one word answer is awesome. Just unbelievably good at executing on that mission, particularly in the last five years when you don't think much has been going on. The net and these tools for knowledge creation, knowledge sharing, knowledge acquisition, and self-expression have flourished around the world in a way that caught most of us by surprise and it is pretty darn fantastic. So the tools available around the world to anybody with a net connected device to educate themselves, to, to share to as much as they want in any media that they want, to contribute to our world's share of knowledge, this is honestly a big deal uh, and, and we're executing on that mission statement like crazy. Uh, the weird wrinkle for a lot of us is that, especially within the last five or ten years, a lot of the organizations that have been allowing us to execute on that mission are for-profit companies. And they're offering us a deal like, I'm going to show you ads in exchange for all, this, all these tools, all these resources that I'm giving you. And around the world, literally a billion people a day, that's, that was Facebook's milestone a while back, said, I'll take that deal. That sounds like a pretty good deal mm -hmm. to me. So, John, as we look ahead at the next five years, what's going to happen? My one word answer is awesomer. Like, we're going to get more of all that, and that's that fantastic. Word? But I think there is a looming threat out there. And I don't want to say that it's, it's dire and we're going to have to make the right decisions or the internet goes away. It's not that bad. But there is a threat out there, and it's a threat from a coalition of people who don't like that bargain. Mm. who think there's something wrong with that bargain out there. And as near as I can identify, uh, I, wrote a, I co wrote a book that came out in January of 2014. I've been talking about it nonstop, and I've come across these coalition members who really seem uncomfortable with that deal. And as far as I can identify, they break down into a, about two main groups. One is incumbents who don't like the disruption that's going on. And exhibit A is basically the press in Europe which has been doing a number of deeply boneheaded things when confronted with this new world of the internet. My single favorite example was the Spanish publishing um, lobbying organization for newspapers in Spain succeeded in forcing Google to not link to their content. So in other words, they said, hey, on Google News, you can't link to Spanish newspaper content unless you pay us for it. And Google said, Google News is a non-revenue product. There's no revenue for us to share with you. So given that, we're going to take all your headlines off of Google News. Traffic to those sites dropped through the floor, and the publishing agency then turned around and said, no, no, please put that back. We didn't mean it. Like, what were they expecting to have happen? So we're seeing these boneheaded things, you know, deeply protectionist, really wrongheaded things from some incumbent industries. That's to be expected. What I really was not expecting was this, um, this hostility 
toward the deal, toward this basic capitalist deal of I give you stuff and in exchange you look at my ads. Right. To me, it seems like a really benign deal. I've been surprised over and over again at how many people I've come across who are you know, hostile or downright enraged at how many suckers around the world are falling for that deal. And I just see the world in a fundamentally different way. So the, my only looming worry about the internet is how this coalition is going to come together and to my eyes, I'm choosing my words carefully, absolutely block the kinds of progress that we've been seeing and put us on a worse path for the next five years. All right, Larry, I mean, I, I flew here to the US early on uh, in, in, the, in the early 90s on the same vehicle I flew two days ago, which is a Boeing 747, which is the most efficient way of moving data across the Atlantic. You fill a 747 with CDs, DVDs, DAT tapes. Um, that hasn't changed in 30 years. Still, the sp I think it actually it was the way. same 747, <laughs> given the look of it. Um, that, that hasn't changed. At the same time, we've generated a huge amount of data from the things that, that Andrew is talking about. What is the challenge for the next five and so on years when you look at those two things brought together? Well, the fundamental thing that has changed is the distributing of data generating devices. So all of your smartphones are data generating devices. They also consume data. But in the academic research world, <clears throat> if you think about how many gene sequencers, mass spectrometers, microscopes, all of the things, telescopes, uh, the things that are really discovering the universe and not just updating their Facebook page with their cat's latest brilliant achievement. Um, that world is really kind of off the internet because the data uh, in the scientific world, unlike the megabyte, like you take a picture and you you know put it on email or, or social network and it's, it's gone instantly, right? because the internet's engineered for megabyte size objects. But science is about gigabytes, that's a thousand <coughs> megabyte size objects. Imagine a photograph a thousand times more data than you're taking on your smartphone. That's a typical small object for say gene sequencing or uh, anything else. And yet a terabyte, which is a million megabytes, um, is completely routine and, and for large community efforts, petabytes, which is a billion megabytes, uh, are uh, in many different fields of science. But you can't put any of that through the normal internet. And so I guess what I'm, I, I see everybody doing more of the same all over the world. It's a wonderful, it's a totally historic change for the human condition. But I also see all the things that it's not doing, the cloud's not doing because it's it's, it's great if, if you have millions of people doing small things. Uh, it can aggregate all that. But I think where we're going to see a lot of the progress is where the universities funded by federal uh, research money are going to do what they've always done, which is bring you the world you live in. Uh, you know, where, where did any of this come from? Where did the Internet come from? Okay, that would be the Defense Department with... DARPA and creating ARPANET. It would be the National Science Foundation in 85 taking the results of those first few experiments like you had in England and deciding that we would build a national system, the NSF net, in 85, right? In 95, after it built out the regionals and the universities, networks, and it became the internet. But I can remember it was 1990 before I saw the dot, first dot com. Hmm. Always before it was dot edu, right. dot gov, or dot mil for the military. And so I know you guys think you invented all this stuff, but actually <laughs> it's the American citizens. This is the, what came out of World War II, was a, a plan in which the American citizens money is taken by the real funder of early stage innovation, the federal government, through the agencies and in, for the citizens invest that in the very best ideas across the universities. And the universities are uh, a couple training students and graduate students to that research. That model really doesn't exist at this scale anywhere in the world. And that's one reason that the United States 
economy is what it is compared to anywhere in the world. And I do think that model is in grave danger over the next five years. And if that happens, whether it's because of the cutting back of federal funding, the vacuuming of the top talent out of the universities into the Googles and Facebooks, et cetera, Amazons, um, so there's nobody left, you know, you're eating the seed corn, people that produce the young people coming. That is an existential threat. I, I agree with exactly half of that. Uh, the half that I agree with is that what makes people like Larry and me smack our heads is the fact that in about a generation, government funding for basic research, whether defense or non-defense, has declined by about a third. Mm -hmm. This is just a jaw-droppingly stupid thing to do. Mm -hmm. Because it, the part I, where I completely agree with Larry is if you trace the family tree of most big innovations back, you don't go too many generations before you find some kind of government research project. And I, and I think it's really important not to lose sight of that. The fact that the part that I'm not on board with is this, this brain drain from academia. If the best minds see better opportunities to do their work and advance knowledge in the private sector than, than, than in a university, off they go. And I think our home industry of higher education is a lazy, sleepy incumbent, and it needs to have some, some pressure put on it. It needs disruption. Yep. Well, well, here it is. It will get it. Yep. <laughs> All right, so, let's just, so we've gone back a little bit in time to the beginning of Silicon Valley with the government essentially creating it, which is kind of ironic because Silicon Valley is scared of the, of the government, right, even though it made it. Well, the, the part that we should be scared of is a lot of countries around the world seem to think that their bureaucrats can pick industrial winners and losers. And the track record is incredibly clear. They cannot. So mo uh, most of my economist colleagues see a really nice differentiation between funding very basic, very original research, because we tend to underinvest in that otherwise. The process of commercializing that research works really well, I think better than any place else in the mm -hmm. world in our economy. What I don't want is allegedly clever people in Washington picking, picking technologies or industries or companies and like putting all the chips on the table. Terrible idea. Amen to that. Good. All right, so I want to go this back. It's going to be less fun if we keep agreeing. I'm going to try and make you argue. So <laughs> I'm going to go back another century. So in the 19th century, um, there was a, a technology that was created that was heralded as changing the world and everything was going to be better, which is the telegraph. And the telegraph, at the time, because Britain was a great power, we laid cables around the world. And by the middle of the 1800s, you could send a message from London to Bombay in about 12 minutes, which is stunning, right? 12 minutes at that time. It had to be relayed, but you could do it. And at the time, if you went to look in the press, there were articles about the end of, the end of wars because people could communicate and understand each other. Um, all the things that were kind of, we seem to sort of think about, about the internet. But we've seen many countries close themselves off and uh, perhaps uh, even more unsurprisingly, Britain started monitoring all those cables and reading all the things that were going across them uh, in, by the end of the 1800s. So, you know, is this, is this communication medium really, really fundamentally changing things or are we fooling ourselves like the Victorians did? I don't think the Victorians were fooling themselves. If you look at the world over the past century and a half, one of the most striking phenomena is how much more peaceful it's become. We lose sight of that. We had a couple nasty wars in the 20th century, and it's easy to overfocus on those. Uh, Steven Pinker wrote a beautiful yes, book exactly. called The Better Angels of Our Nature, where he documented with, with real rigor the levels of violence, the levels of big arm conflict, the levels of smaller scale brush fire arm conflict. Right. They are all heading in one direction, and that direction is down. And part of his explanation for that is, as we actually come together, we do s and, and communicate with each other, this is not just Pollyanna gauzy thinking, we do seem to thump on each other less. And there are way too many exceptions to that, but that, that does appear to be the pattern. And David Brin and the previous, and two panels ago, um, actually referred to exactly the okay. same book. Okay. And I'd recommend another book to all of you. How many of you read The Victorian Internet? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So the rest of you need to. Um, <laughs> because that is the telegraph. And, yeah. and, it, and it was, abs it w I would argue that it was more mm -hmm. globally, economically transformational than what we have seen since 95. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fundamentally changed everything. Okay, you guys are agreeing way too much. So okay, I, let's work on that. I go to other <laughs> topics. So, um, so Mark Andreessen, who's a fairly well-known investor, sa has said this thing about software eating the world. So why don't we talk about that? I mean, as, as a programmer, I'm very happy about that because it means I probably still have a job. But um, 
but some people probably won't have jobs because software is going to do that, and it's also going to change the way businesses are working. Earlier on in the security panel, um, I, I said that you know a lot of these businesses like VW haven't realized that they are software businesses now, and that's changing things. So what does that mean, software is eating the world, and what are the consequences? Uh, I came across, I, I've talked with Mark about this, I came across a, an essay, not one that he wrote, but one that absolutely blew me away, uh, published online, and it's called The Return of Nature, and it's written by a guy who documents these crazy phenomena around the world. I was completely unaware, year after year, we are using less cropland across the globe to feed more people with more calories and better calories. We are actually decreasing, in absolute terms, the resource intensity of, of many, many things around the planet. His, one of his broad explanations for what's going on is he calls it dematerialization. Like you just need fewer atoms when you have more code and when you have more bits to, to accomplish what you want to do in the world. I, and the, the, the evidence is striking, and I, I thought I kind of understood the phenomena. The evidence is absolutely striking. I think it's absolutely some of the best news on the planet. The one big caveat is I believe, and this is where Mark and I argue back and forth, I believe that one of the things we are going to need less of, one of the resources, is good old-fashioned labor. Uh, Mark, Mark thinks that entrepreneurs and innovators are going to keep coming up with things for people to do. Yeah. I think they're going to keep coming up with really, really cool things. I just don't think they're going to need nearly as many people to accomplish those things, especially as we look out farther and farther into the future and our colleagues at Qualcomm develop the chips that are going to allow completely autonomous cars and vehicles and drones. Okay. Like, I, I, in my lifetime, I think I'm going to see a staggeringly abundant economy that does not need very much human labor. More than zero, but not anything like we see today. So another way that I've talked about this is, and this is maybe because I'm a physicist, the world, you know, the physical world is made of atoms, not bits. It's a very strange thing. Take DNA. It's a molecule. Where is the A, T, C's, and G's of the genetic code? That's an abstraction that somehow rides on top of this. And so what we're seeing with the internet, think of before there was a billion cell phones, now there's a billion cell phones, and there's gonna be a trillion sensors in the internet of things. There's this plague of bits moving across the physical world. Now what software does mm. is eats bits. And so if you think about it, it's sort of like the Cambrian explosion, mm. until the bits were out there, there was, it, the, the software would starve to death. So, and, <laughs> and the more bits there are, the more the world can be read out and into uh, a virtual version of that world, yeah. and which you now can take what we've learned about the laws of physics, which are themselves abstractions from the physical world, you can then simulate those. And so, you know, when we're talking about global warming and all that, or, or you know, more, the next time you get a weather report that says the tornado is right here, that's because of incredible advances in supercomputing and simulating that physical world. So I think the software is eating the world. It's, it ate it once before, um, which was before there was DNA. Mm. Yep. The world's been around a couple of billion years, but, you know, the Earth. But until, once, once self-replication became a property of molecules, it sort of built on itself, and that's the same thing we see now, which is a, thing, a point that Bill Joy made when he wrote his uh, epic uh, blog and, and wired, the future doesn't need us. Mm -hmm. And that set off a global controversy, which all... You know, which really bears going back and thinking, because he, he got it, I think, very right in terms of sorting out what the implications of the software eating the world is. This, this is a bummer, because we're just agreeing way too much. Right. But, but one of the consequences of this explosion that, that you're talking about is that we are able to get smart about the world in ways that we never, ever could Absolutely. before. And, and this is a big deal. This is a knowledge explosion. This is like a, a human understanding of the world explosion. My single favorite example, um, how many of us use Duolingo or have ever used Duolingo to try to learn another language? Hands, could you hands way up, look, look around the room? 
right? Yeah. This wow. is by far the world's most popular method for learning another language. It's also the world's best, as, outside of having um, a romantic partner who doesn't share a language with you. This is, that's first best. Um, <laughs> second best is Duolingo. And it's a distant second, but second best is Duolingo. It's the biggest and the best platform for learning another language. The reason why that is, is not because Louis Van Aan, who developed it, was, a, was a, a scholar or knew anything about how people acquire language. In fact, he tells a fascinating story that he, he, when he built this thing and it, and it started growing like a weed, and he's like, I think I've got something here. So he actually, he left academia to go start a company. Uh, I, I don't bemoan that fact. But he said, I, I thought I better go get some books about how people acquire language. So he started grabbing books and reading them about how to teach language and how people acquire language. And he said, I, I would go grab one book and it would say, absolutely do this and never ever do that. And the next book I would read would flip that advice completely on its head. We had all these theories about the best way for people to acquire language, but because we didn't have enough evidence and enough data and we couldn't run experiments, we didn't really, we were all just guessing. We were guessing for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, Luis, by running A-B testing on all this stuff, you know, down to the super granular level, has cracked that nut. And now we have better ways to acquire a second language than we've ever had before. I love that. All right, so we've got to our last three minutes where we're going to allow the, the public to ask some questions. So who wants to ask some questions of these two guys? Uh, this is Finn from uh, Hong Kong Internet Society. So we promote the internet to get everyone online. So my question is, uh, some areas they don't, without internet, it's hard to get online. So we aim not only to get the next billion online, but the last billions online. So what do you think about to solve this problem on how far we are from there? Thank you. Uh, I, I think there are, there are two forces, actually one big force at work, and that's competition is what's going to make that happen. So if we sit around and wait for the governments and the countries at the base of the pyramid to roll out broadband to their citizens, we're going to be waiting a long, long time. What I would love for them to do instead is get the hell out of the way and let different kinds of, of bandwidth provider come in and fight in their countries and let Google fly their blimps and Facebook fly their planes overhead and, and get some connection that way. That I, by, to me, that's the easiest and quickest way that we're going to solve that last billion problem. I wanted to ask you what do you think about, uh, you talk about uh, the deal of accept your content with ads and stuff. What do you think right now with the ad blocking uh, debate that's going on and also related to that, the power of a company like Google or, or Apple to actually control that destiny? You want to go? Well, I don't worry about uh, Google or even Apple, which is much more, I think, an inward looking uh, company that that demands everything be a certain way because of the competition. Uh, I think they all know they could be gone <laughs> in 10 years if, and I mean, Apple had Apple was once, almost gone. once or two dear, near death experiences, and now it happens to be close to the most valuable company on earth. But uh, as long as we have this intensity of competition that we have here, uh, I don't think anybody is safe. And, and my career is just long enough to remember when we were deathly afraid that Microsoft was going to choke off innovation throughout the technology sector. Anyone scared about that these days? No. Right? I, 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 I have trouble getting worried about the alleged dominance of big tech companies because of the pattern Larry identifies. They do become dominant. They're, these are winner, these tend toward winner take all markets. These are a big deal. And then they get kneecapped from below by some little company you've never heard of that grows up into the next great big company. Uh, we should be vigilant about all big concentrations of power but we should be a little bit confident given the pattern in the tech industry that, that today's giants might not be the, the giants of tomorrow, or at least the movers and shakers of tomorrow. All right, sounds like we've got time for one more question, if there is one. Sure, sure I've got one. Um, you said something that resonated with me because I worked for a robotic telescope company and we dealt with terabytes of data. Um, I don't disagree that we're gonna see uh, innovation continue to steamroll. What I'm concerned about and what I'm wondering how we solve this is, as we build better mousetraps, how do we save ourselves from all that great technology just being used for mediocrity, like sharing those cat photos that you were talking right, about, right, right. instead of the scientific data that we could yeah. be advancing the human race with? 
Well, fortunately, the National Science Foundation has spent the last three years investing uh, in over 130 to 150 campuses across the country and building big data cyber infrastructures based on optical fibers at which your back, your point to point from, you know, the telescope to the astronomer is anywhere from 10,000 megabits a second to 100,000 megabits a second to the individual. And we can do, for instance, 9.6 out of 10 gigabits disk to disk from inside of one university to inside of another university now. And I've just been funded as principal investigator to build that out across the entire west coast as far uh, west as Hawaii and east as Chicago as a subnational model for a separate big data freeway system just like in this country you could argue that president what Bernie Sanders calls that socialist Dwight Eisenhower um, who had this big government program to do a duplicate um, transportation infrastructure I mean we had a good two-lane highways you know route 66 highway 40 we had city streets what was wrong with that? But somehow the cities decided they couldn't get from point A to point B anymore, so they built freeway systems, a redundant infrastructure made out of the same concrete and asphalt. And then Dwight Eisenhower saw that and called for hooking them together with the interstate highway system. And all of a sudden, you could go from New York, middle of Manhattan, to downtown San Francisco without seeing a stoplight. And that was radical as someone who spent 12 hours going from one state to another when I was a young person in the car. Um, and that basically drove the economy for the next 50 years. And so the NSF, very quietly, I doubt that any of you know that this is going on, has made a massive investment of nearly $100 million in uh, all of these universities to live in a new internet for big data, all the while continuing to upload those very important cat videos. All right. <laughs> on, the on, the, on that note, the most important note there, cat videos. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, John.